Welcome to ADHD is over, a new podcast on a seemingly old label that we're going to be peeling off. Join my wife, Tatiana, and I as we journey with our family, the Wyden family, through the land of confusing information. We're going to visit both sides and let you decide because the power is with you. Welcome to ADHD is over. All right. Welcome back. My guest today is spiritual therapist and teacher Rafia Morgan. For over 40 years, Rafia has been deeply involved with spiritual growth work. After graduating from UC Berkeley in 71, he recognized a need to move away from social and political action and focus on meditation and inner exploration. In 1978, he met his spiritual master, Osho, and spent many years in his presence. He had the honor of being part of a small group of people that traveled the world with Osho for one year. During this time and after, he worked as Osho's personal photographer. Rafia has training in many therapeutic approaches, including postural integration, bioenergetics, Reichian character analysis, and breath work, primal somatic experiencing trauma therapy, and the diamond logos essence work of Faisal Mukhadam. He is a creator of many processes in the Osho therapy world, such as the inner man, inner woman work, the path of love, and the Osho therapist training. Welcome, Rafi. I'm, I'm glad to have you here. Well, I'm happy to be here with you, Roman. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Uh, so I want to dive right in. I mean, your past is just amazing for anyone that's into spiritual and personal growth work. I'm a big fan of of Osho's um, work and wisdom. And I've seen countless videos, mostly videos now. That's how we take stuff in, right? Mm. And I just feel that what comes across when talking to you or seeing your work, there is this, there's a similar groundedness. There's a, a knowing, a confidence. So perhaps we can start off a, a little bit about that. We just talked about that in our pre-interview chat. Uh, talk to me about this how did you get to this this grounded, this knowing, this confidence that I think a lot of men uh, today are lacking, including myself? It's a constant struggle to be that way. Well, I think it it wasn't even particularly a goal. It was just that I was very curious about myself, about my personality, about my conflicts, about the need to inquire deeply into myself. And in that, I started to notice places where I was efforting, places where I was performing, places where I was trying to cover some deep feeling of deficiency, like I didn't have what it takes, I wasn't really grounded. And it's typical of personalities that they're based on that way with a kind of false will generator that's trying to make it all the time. And it, it was leaving me empty. And so I had the good fortune to have teachers that pointed to that efforting side and encouraged me to really look into it and to feel into it and stay present into it. And in that process, I think I came slowly, slowly, and it's still a work in progress of being grounded, relaxed, and confident in myself and with a, a trust that I do have inside of me what it takes to meet the challenges that life would give me. And so I'm efforting a lot less than I used to. I'm preparing a lot less. I still prepare if I have to do something. You know, I make a few notes and I know the direction I want to go. But then I kind of, let's, let's see what happens and what, see what comes out. And so I've become in that more spontaneous, I think more contactful to the people that I'm talking to and more human than somebody who's up there trying to pitch a seemingly great line of spiritual wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I'm kind of very, I'm very on the human side of things. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And I think obviously a lot of that, if we wanted to kind of just strip some of that away, a lot of it is obviously the amount of years lived and the experience, right. And the yeah. point, the, the, the perspectives on life, but um, when we're talking about, and I'm going to bring this now to a more of the ADHD world, uh, when we're talking about it, you know, uh, boys or let's just focus on this for now, but boys or young men becoming adults, 
um, they don't have the same life experience. At the same time, they have the same uh, type of perhaps uh, uh, insecurities or, or not feeling safe, not feeling confident or comfortable in their own skin, right? right. And what, what, do you, what do you feel contributes to that uh, nowadays with young uh, boys, young, young adults, um, especially men, if we're going to focus on that right now, what do you think creates that kind of uh, lack of, of, of feeling grounded? I know that's a big question, but. No, it's a, it's a very relevant question. And it's something that I consider a lot. And I don't know if it's more intense now than it used to be, could be perhaps just by the nature of the world being more complex. But I think it, it in so many of us, we missed the support of our fathers. We missed feeling like somebody was really there for us. We missed, we missed a really safe holding environment where we felt appreciated and loved and where we could relax and be ourselves and where we could relate in an authentic way. And we didn't get, and, but a lot of times for boys, it comes back to that relationship with the father, you know, and you ask people, was your father really present with you? Was he really there? And not so many people will really say that. They say, yeah, he was around, but he was always busy with this thing or he was absent. And so that translates into uh, a lack of inner support in a boy that he can trust, you know, that, that things are going to be okay, he can be relaxed and confident and grounded with himself. And then as he gets older, and I think this is a big missing piece in the Western world is the lack of rites of passage to take us into and welcome us into manhood. And I look back at my own life and I think sometimes, my God, if I had had a proper rite of passage that I went through and and then I was welcomed into the world of men and men shared with me and, and told me their life experiences and I, and I understood a lot of things from that transmission, I would have, it would have saved me a lot of scars on my heart and mistakes mm. that I made, which maybe have been good teachers in the end. But um, so it has a lot to do, and there's many issues about it, but it has a lot to do with the relationship with the father, I think, mm. and the feeling of support and that somebody is really there. And this thing of being initiated, you know, like, because it's just all left so vague. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. What, what comes up for me right now, that's beautiful. The two things are obviously the men's work, right? The men's groups, like you said, <clears throat> and for for those of you listening who might not be familiar of rites of passages, it's all, it can also be called an initiation or a transition, right? From, uh, from the boy to the man or the young adult. Uh, <clears throat> so two things came up. One is men's work. And then the other one is this, this idea that, I mean, it, it's beautiful, right? That, that other men come together and, and sort of the village, the tribe. And we don't, we don't have that anymore nowadays. So what are, what are the, what are some ways that perhaps, parents, and I don't want to jump to tips already, but I feel like asking what are some of the ways that we could or that you see uh, that we could have these initiations today, right, in this in this society? Are there things like that? that well, there are. There's a friend of mine in Australia named um, Arna Rubinstein who really studied rites of passage in indigenous cultures, and he identified like five common basic things that are always there. And I can't name the list right now off the top of my head, but he built them into a program. And so, and it's opened up in Australia for fathers and their sons around the age of 12, 13, 14, to go through a five day process together. And he's a bit of a scientist and he's been really measuring and following the kids that go through it. And he's found tremendous statistical results from the success or well-being or lack of trouble that the boys who went through that have had, so much so that the Australian government is coming in and is bringing it into schools. Now, if this would happen, and, you know, 
Australian boys and girls would go through some kind of initiation process that was very well designed. You you would see, I think, culturally, some people really stepping out in front of the pack because there'd be a lot of healthier people in their population. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I'd love to get the information uh, on a separate note, but that sounds exactly what I want to do with my son's about to turn 12 uh, in a week, a uh, week and a half. So uh, I've been I've been craving something that him and I can do in the next few years, you know, to have that. Yeah. And I can put you in touch with Arna also. He's a friend of mine. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. And I can mention that in the show notes as well for our listeners. And uh, so um, let's talk about, so if we're initiating our boys correctly and we, we you know, is it fair to say that what's, What's lacking, and you touched upon this earlier a little bit, what's lacking is that that these boys feel safe, right? They feel uh, in, in their homes, uh, even in their own skin, that they feel a level of certainty, protected, safe, loved, nurtured, right? Um, if not, then their nervous system is constantly uh, on guard, creating this uh, perhaps we call it uh, hyperactivity or impulsivity or just distracted, not being present. What do you say about, you've done a lot of work in the, you know, trauma therapy, uh, somatic experiencing. Um, am I, am I on, not onto something here? Obviously I'm not, I'm not the inventor of this, but it, it could it be true that the, when the nervous system is calmed and not uh, on guard or, you know, trying to analyze threats that, a little human being in this case can calm down and can relax and can actually pay attention. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if, if we're on guard all the time, you're basically braced against something bad coming mm -hmm. and you, and then you're, 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 you're repeating probably traumas that have happened in the past. And we become geniuses at creating the circumstances to re-experience our traumas or to find the evidence to confirm that the environment around us is not safe, loving, warm, you know, caring for us. So the atmosphere of feeling like there, there's somebody I can go to where I'm going to be received and listened, listened to and understood and held and, and shared with in an honest way is tremendously healing so that that guardedness and that frozenness in the nervous system doesn't just lock in and start shutting off vast aspects of our being. So I think, I think the, uh, what I often call the holding environment that the child grows up in and the amount of love and trust that's in there, the warmth, the, the care, the contact, has a lot to do with how the personality forms and 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 then the resilience that that personality will have and the, the ability to go to high energetic states and to deep relaxed states. You know, the, what the autonomic nervous system needs for its regulation is both of those. And when that gets interrupted by traumatic or very frightening experiences, we freeze. And then our range gets less and less and less. Mm -hmm. And is it, um, uh, you know, talk to me about the uh, PTSD, because I feel like post-traumatic stress disorder or symptoms are very similar to ADHD in a way that they, they something happens, we can't process it or heal it uh, right away. And so now the nervous system is on guard, right? Right. Yeah, it's on guard and the resiliency is lost and the inter the capacity to interact really in a helpful way, in a useful way for yourself to express yourself it has so many manifestations and it is very healable. You know, it's very healable by somebody really facilitating a person going in and resolving some of the, the traumas that have happened is one way. There's There are a number of different ways that are coming out these days. And people regain that resiliency rather than just be locked into a kind of frozen nervous system state where they just magically, it seems like, keep recreating the same old scenes over and over again. Mm -hmm. 
And it, I mean, it's quite a tragedy, I think, the way that diagnos diagnosis happens for children and that labeling and the stigma attached to it and the use of pharmaceuticals. I mean, my God, we might be numbing out the most brilliant among us. Yeah. And what do you think can be the effect of uh, labels and diagnosis on a, on a child's being confidence uh, in the future? What do you see? What kind of, what kind of uh, boys or men are we raising if we continue to uh, suppress them with medication? Well, first of all, the stigma of having that label put on you and then being ostracized or treated differently than the others are treated creates a, a wound pattern in people. And then they start to, see, and then self-worth and value also can go way down or a very strong aggressive acting out can happen. You know, the a rebellion against, which can also have negative consequences for the, the child or the person. Um, and what was the rest of your question? I get yeah, I'm just curious, like what effects could that have on, a ch on children, right? Because we're suppressing their ultimately their impulsivity, which I think has a lot of a lot of creative people uh, are impulsive in a good way. Right. Yeah. And also their their intuition. I feel like uh, that when we when we don't allow for impulsivity, that th to me, that's what's needed to calibrate our intuition. So what, what would that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And if that gets cut and that gets put in a box or that gets drugged out by giving basically amphetamines to kids, um, then of course that person, that person can, can become very damaged in their self-confidence and they can become damaged in their capacity to relate. And they can even, I think, be, be damaged on a level of nervous system, brain, et cetera. Or, the people around him to understand and those and those people aren't willing to go there and really meet that person. Yeah. So what do you see today when you look around in your work, like the men that are, you know, that, that you're working with, uh, the missing fathers in the household and so forth? Um, what's present for you? Okay. Well, first of all, it's really interesting that a lot more women are coming to work on themselves right now than men in general. Hmm. And I don't know exactly how to measure that, except that I think a lot of men have given up and, and, or they have some kind of proud pride and they're posturing themselves as having it together as a compensation for the deeper feeling that they don't. And they haven't come to that point where they're really willing to open up and, and reach out and ask for help. So there's a, there's a lot of kind of, um, false will and pride in a lot of guys that prevents them from from coming forth and really presenting the problems that they have. And one of the things that I work with with men a lot of times is I get them. I talk about castration, and I talk about that that all of us have suffered some level of castration where we feel we've gotten cut off from our natural. Um, impulse and connection to our masculinity and how did that happen did it happen with mother did it happen with father how does that show up and play out in her life how are we trying to compensate for that all the time so as boys we're so seldomly really raised in a healthy way where we feel really connected to ourselves and connected to our masculinity and and now young men have to wear this badge of of this name called toxic masculinity as though masculinity in and of itself is toxic and it's not i don't believe that for a second but i do believe we have to go back and we have to look at the place where we got cut off from our connection to our masculinity, whether that was through our father or through something and admit that that happened and open up to the vulnerability that's there of feeling like I don't really have what it takes. You know, it's, it literally comes down to in castration of feeling like I don't have what it takes down there. So I put on a big one up here and become a dickhead. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that from one of your videos. I, I had to laugh out loud, uh, but it's, yeah. it may sound funny, but you have a really great point. I didn't want to interrupt you, but yeah, the, the, the being a dickhead. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to penetrate the world with your head and your mind. 
instead of with your presence and your and your groundedness and your and your relaxed confidence as a man. And that's a piece of work. And I think that um, what I've found is that men, when they come together in men's groups, are very quickly able to get into that feeling of their of frustration, of um, of vulnerability and weakness, and how much they're missing that connection with other men. And there is really something called male bonding that's really true. Men are very generous with each other when they come together, and they they meet and they support each other. And it's like you see men get like having peak experiences in a men's group just through some simple exercise where they're doing something together and they're maybe waking up to their strength a little bit and they're holding each other and and they're healing right in front of my eyes like i've seen it so many times you know and and then i find men very generous with each other you know very compassionate very very willing to support yeah. So I really see this as a big uh, imbalance, right? The dance of the masculine and the feminine. We both on both sides, uh, transgenerationally, have crossed the wires and like castration comes to mind. Um, also for uh, f- for men not to be emotionally available, but we need to be strong, but we should also be vulnerable. Um, who else? I mean, this is not mainstream teaching. How come? Yeah, I mean, the world would be a much better place if it was. And we'd have mm-hmm. a much, much, let's say in America, if you look at who's running the country and what's happening in the Senate right now and who was just president. Donald Trump, for me, is a great example of a castrated man. Mm. He mm-hmm. comes across and he plays the strong guy really well, but, but actually he's the, he's the schoolyard bully who underneath it all feels like he doesn't have anything Mm. and it becomes very entitled and, and tries to overpower people. And this is kind of the world we live in. And that's the outer manifestation of compensation for being castrated is, is the dickheads is the, the bullies, the pushers, the manipulators and not the authentic men. Mm. Is it possible uh, at the same time that in the case of, say, a single mother, wife, woman who now has kids, um, that they're they are almost forced to step more into the masculine energy as a as a single parent. And therefore, castration of a young boy might might happen uh, more naturally because the woman is taking on the role of the man and the woman. Is there something there that you're observing as well? Well, yeah, that gets into a very big area um, that I have a do a lot of teaching with, also with women, and and I relate back to Jungian psychology a lot for that, where there's an expression called animus possession, and it's a natural compensation for the devaluation of the feminine, or the woman who, as you said, is a single mother and is out there in the world and has to make it. And a lot of times the feminine attributes are put to the side and that more masculine side is really kind of overdeveloped and running the woman's life. And it's not home base for a woman really, you know, it's, it's functional, it works, but it can also be very castrating towards men. And, also to young boys when the mother's struggling so much she isn't necessarily having enough time to be in her you know nurturing feminine qualities Mm -hmm. and that has a lot to do with the absent father and so then we get back to the men where are the men why are they not at why are they absent why do they not show up you know and that's been the cry of women for a long time where are the men Mm. where are the men you know, and th- th- in so many cases, they're absent, or if the, even if they're present, they're very castrated, and they're stuck in being pleasers or little boys, which also brings out the animus in the woman, because it's not what she wants. She wants a man who's present, who's there. And so she compensates for that, and she doesn't feel safe with a man who's a pleaser. 
You know, it's like the man, the masculine's not there. So she then becomes protected or feminine doesn't feel safe. And she goes stronger, stronger into the male side and then dominates the guy and then castrates him regularly. Every time he shows up with his, his pleaser thing or goes back to the little boy. And then there it is that kid who didn't get supported to really embody the masculine and be able to stand up and be be grounded in the masculine and be willing to take the risk with the woman to, by saying the truth, risking that the woman will reject him or get angry with him. And many of us men are very, very frightened of that. And so we go, we revert back to this little boy who's trying to take care of upset mother. And like I said in a moment ago, I think women hate that. Yeah, no, that's well said. It definitely resonates with me. I, I didn't have a very strong male role model. I mean, my dad was phenomenal and, and as present as he could, but I, I do feel like my mom was wearing the pants, right? She was the disciplinary. Yeah. Hence, hence, that was my, my picture of women or of women to stay away from or, you know, it's like, oh, there she goes again, like my mom, you know, yeah. but then I was attracting that. So it's almost like you said, it's that cycle being stuck in that, you know? And the risk is to come out of that is for the man to come into himself, recognize his own feelings, his own values, his own needs, and to speak up about them and tell the truth and risk the woman's rejection and possible anger. And that's really a very important thing. And when you don't feel really scared, secure you're scared of women or you've had some kind of trauma around that it's difficult to access and so one of the things is getting in touch with what what do you feel and being willing to share your feelings what do you need and being willing to put out what do you value and standing for your values and another one for men i think is also what is your vision and being willing to put your vision out. And these things generally also make the woman feel relaxed when a man is telling the truth. The woman knows it immediately. When a man is expressing his feelings honestly, you know, this is what I feel, this is what I need, this is what I value, this is my vision. Ah, oh, the woman is like, yes, my man is here. So this is a big teaching. Yeah, that's beautiful. With to get in touch with these things. And then we do exercises to free up that and to bring, to bring that out, like feelings, values, needs, vision. Beautiful. Now that makes me think of, you know, a, a little boy who's being raised by a single mother and the, the father is not there. Um, that ought to be really hard for the mother or for that household to generate any kind of grounded masculine energy any kind of certainty of the future. And so hence, it's adding a lot more stress and trauma. Yeah, exactly. And it's a, it's a, it's a never ending loop, you know, and then again, where is the guy, not the woman who is in her masculine, but where is the male who's relaxed and confident and present and loving and strong and, and, and it's just basically holding the space somehow for the family and for the woman and the child. And there is something that's very it, traditionally, historically, and I think factually right about a man's place in that family structure as someone who holds the space. It's also the protector, you know, and, and guardian of that space. And a lot of men just don't know how to do that. They, they, they can't do it. And if that happens, everybody relaxes. The woman relaxes. The woman can also go into her feminine. She can also express herself in her masculine side, but in a positive way. The kids relax. They grow up with a basic trust that, that life is good rather than life is scary and hard and, and crazy. And would you say that even when um, the father now lives in a different house, right? Different, uh, you know, shared custody, from there, can a man still still provide certainty and, and his presence even when they're even during a divorce? I mean, it depends on the situation, but 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 he can, you know, he can also be really clear about why and responsible for his part of why the marriage didn't work and be clear with that. 
and not be in a blaming role because if he's in that blaming thing it's all gonna it's all gonna fall apart you know so uh, sure a man can still provide that and he can work together with his ex and have some agreement about what's really important and what his role is in bringing up the child and how he wants to interact with his children and be strong about that. And then he has a right to that so that the kids at least grow up. Maybe dad wasn't there all the time, but he's got to be there. He's got to be around. He's got to be in the field. You know, he's got to, if, if he's really absent, there's going to be a hole there, the missing father. And that's a huge pain point for so many men and so many women also. And then yeah. if he was there, maybe he was drunk or violent or, you know, acting out his frustration in the house and everybody was scared or he was collapsed and withdrawn and the woman was dominating the whole space. I mean, very few of us grow up with really healthy versions of the mask on. And it's interesting that we then, you know, call the child the problem in the case of a child with ADHD, where the nervous system is on guard, you know, they're pre um frontal cortex is busy processing a divorce versus learning algebra at school. Maybe, just maybe, the way the household is going, the masculine feminine imbalance in the household has a lot to do with not allowing the child to relax and feel safe, right? Yes, absolutely right. You know, it's like, and you know it, you know, and, and everything registers in the field. This is something that I, even if you fake it, what registers in the field is fakeness, mm. you know? And so the, the, let's say in the ideal situation, the man and the woman are really committed to really being embodiments of masculine and feminine and a wholeness and know that that registers in the field, even the intent to have that registers in the field and brings relaxation. Mm. You know, it's something you can't fake. If you, if you're faking it, the fakeness also registers and the child will feel it. They'll feel like, mm, this doesn't really register with me. Yeah. You know, something will freeze. It's not really safe. Safety is really like when, when groundedness is there and when people are present, you know, and, and it doesn't mean they're always in agreement about things, but they're present and they're on us and the child will feel that. And then he'll be relaxed in his nervous system. Mm, that's great. Yeah, that really gets me present to how ignorant we are. Essentially, we, we think only what we say and do in front of a child is going to register and affect them. But it's what you're saying is it's much more than that that's coming across. It's much more. Everything, everything registers in the field. In essence, for you, what is ADHD? When you think of this term, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, however you want to break that down, what's present for you? What, what does it mean to you? First of all, there's something with the nervous system that has been shocked and, and that is ramped up the energy levels rather than going to um, a lessened activity like a dampened activity it's gone to a heightened one but i think there are some people who are who are just that heightened nervous activity comes through a lot of times through a really brilliant mind and a really creative person and they're just all over the place but they don't they don't have the regulation then that comes down and brings them into that total soft safe place so that then their energy can build up in a a natural way hit its peak and then recede back down into rest but it just stays on that level and and then it becomes a vicious circle because it starts driving people crazy mm. the people around them they don't know what to do with it i've never really looked at it through this window before you know of the relationship to the masculine i'm curious what you found in your work with that. Yeah, yeah. And very similar. Obviously, I'm not an expert or I'm becoming an ex more of an expert in ADHD after, you know, six years of looking into it. But uh, we're definitely noticing that the nervous system is on guard, right? It's been shocked. Uh, it yeah. can't relax. Uh, and then more, more stress and more trauma is added naturally in this world and in turbulent families. But that the masculine 
certainty and the groundedness of the father or the male role in, in a, if it's a same sex marriage or, you know, there's always more of a masculine, more of a feminine, I believe. Yeah. When that's not grounded or certain that, that it, it's not going to help. Like it may not be the cause. It could have been the cause early on, but at least it's inflaming the symptoms. That's what we're yeah, finding. I, yeah. And I, I do think there's something about the expression of the masculine energy and the expression of the feminine energy. If they're both there, there's a wholeness in what I call the field. And that in that wholeness, there's going to be intrinsically a lot of safety, a lot of warmth. There's also going to be fun. There's going to be something loose and easy between the people that the child's going to love and he's going to, and he's going to relax into that. And then he becomes more and more contactful, you know, and sometimes the ADHD has, has gone out of the bandwidth where you're really making contact. It's, it's just going so fast. The nervous system is just locked in that. And, and yet I think, you know, that frozenness can really be melted down just by being in a loving atmosphere in a safe atmosphere. And, and it just starts to, and not by drugging kids up. Yeah. That's a band aid, right? Like my wife and I, we've come up with this terminology that the, the child is the check engine light of the family, right? It's letting the family know something is not right for me to feel safe and loved and, and right. Be present. Yeah. Yeah. And then what do you do when you, when you, if, if you're in that situation and you see that, then what's, what's the action the parents need to take in your view? I'm curious. I think it's sort of in line with what, what you're teaching, which I think, uh, in our book that we're writing, we're breaking it down into three. It, it's a three-step process. First, it's shift your perspective. The child's not the problem. Second one is heal your shit, which comes down to what you're teaching. Yeah. Stop the transgenerational hand-me-down parenting. Yeah. And the third one is honor your child. Yeah. Um, right. And so we're finding that the hardest part of that work is really to heal your own shit. And honoring your child will come as a result of healing your shit. But healing your shit, as you know, uh, we call it healing your shit because really it takes work. It's yucky. It's not pretty, you know, um, which is why I loved, uh, I was looking forward to talk, talking to you about it because I had a feeling that we're both kind of onto the same thing in a way that if the man is present and the masculine steps up, then the, fe the feminine can relax and nurture and create so one of my other mentors always says, well, men, when in doubt, we go first. We don't wait for the women to drop into their feminine for us to be able to be masculine. So, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. And, and that's the risk. And that feels like a big risk to a lot of men, you know, um, and it, but it's absolutely essential for the man's own sense of dignity and self-respect and capacity to, to recognize boundaries and to hold the space, to be loving, to be responsive to whatever's happening in the moment and be ready to go first. <laughs> exactly. I knew you would, uh, I had a feeling you would agree with that because uh, I don't know. I just, I just feel as a man that we, we know that in, in, in intuitively that part of our certainty is like, let me, let me handle this. Let me go first. Um, but what comes up for me a lot is my own, you know, parenting, my own father's uh, way of being, which is, eh, I'll just let her calm down. And only when she's calmed down, I'll make a joke and then we'll just move on, you know? Yeah. But it's not the certainty. No, it's not certainty. What would you say, uh, what would be your advice to, to men if they're in a you know, family structure right now with a child and perhaps there's chaos and trauma and stress? And um, what can a man do right off the bat? Where do we even start? I mean, honestly, I think the best doorway and the very first group that I did in my life was a men's group. And I think I was about 23 and I'd gone through a, a real heartbreak end of a relationship and I felt really betrayed. And I, I was not in a good space. 
you know, and I just come out of university. I didn't feel prepared to be an adult. I didn't feel prepared to do anything really. And I found a men's group just by chance in Berkeley, everything was happening there. And I walked into that room and within minutes, the men had me in the center of the circle and were prodding me to get into my anger and get real about what I was really feeling. And I did. And I remember, it, I remember it like it was yesterday, that when I walked out of that place, I felt like, oh my God, my life has just changed. Because I did not have access to a whole range of my emotions. They were cut off from my past and my conditioning and everything. And these guys just pushed me and supported me at the same time. And the truth was, is that I was so angry about what had happened with this woman. And yet I wasn't allowing myself to really feel the anger. And so I was just going round and round in my head. I could cry and I could be in my head, but I couldn't allow that anger. As soon as the anger came, I was done with the whole situation. One session. So what men can do is seek help with other men and, and be part of men's groups and go in there because our experience in the places where we feel deficient and those places that we struggle with are really kind of, you could say universal. They're things that, that other men will relate to and to feel that, that support coming and that understanding coming, and then that willingness to, and then challenged also to come out to your edge, you know, and not be withdrawn, not be moody, not be sulking, but to come forth with your energy, which has a big part, which is a big part of the masculine, and to be encouraged to do that, to be challenged to do that by other men, not in a performing way, but in a genuine way, to step up to the line and just say your truth. So much movement can happen really fast once we break out of that box of holding back. You know, it's like it's it's a very important thing, and that relates to your going first. It's like holding back is a nightmare for the masculine energy. The masculine energy needs to come out. So, and and groups, you know, creates seemingly artificial situations which challenge very real aspects of us and help us to come out and express who we really are and say it and stand in it and to own it, be responsible for it, come out of the judgment, come out of the hiding, you know, and, and, and stand there in presence in, in your stuff, whatever it is, and let go of all the judgment and everything that's wrapping, that's wrapped around it. So I encourage men to, to, seek out, you know, groups, because even companionship with men can often very quickly go into a degraded version of how men hang out. And so you, often the space of a, of a men's group is really, really helpful. Mm. Yeah. So what I'm getting here too, is that we, we are a bunch, I include myself, we're a bunch of uh, scared boys running away from our mothers and you know our, our masculine or our, our wives or girlfriends when they're in their masculine are threatening to us mm -hmm. yet at the same time when our children uh, are fearful or not present or running away we call them a problem yes exactly exactly well that's certainly enough for me to think about and for for all of us and i hope you know that that whoever listens to this and sees this uh especially the men to uh, perhaps like you suggested to become part of a, a men's group and i've i've been in a few men's groups and i'm going to join another one i i agree as well that it's been challenging confronting but loving and powerful and you know the, the brotherhood the community really isn't isn't just a, a kumbaya thing. It really, no, it really is. It's real. Yeah. 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 And, and I believe, and, and it sounds like you're, uh, you know, on the same page with me that if we men go first and we uh, step into our power and reclaim uh, masculinity, that uh, the feminine can relax and nurture and create, and we can have more harmonious households with less stress and trauma. 
and then we can overcome the traumas of life together and and move forward right in confidence and in love and then perhaps ADHD will be over who knows yeah and, and, and I would say when that happens there's 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 a natural polarity between men and women that that just feels good it feels good to the participants of that polarity and it also feels good to the children in that thing mom and dad love each other i can feel it they're attracted to each other they're fun to be around you know each one is home you know mom's at home in her feminine dad's at home in her masculine which doesn't mean we don't have other sides man has a feminine side the woman has a masculine side nothing wrong with it but basically to be at home in your biological gender i think creates a huge relaxation in 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 the individual but also in the field of the home and it would be you know I'll be really curious to see where you go with this with ADHD because I haven't seen it applied in this way or a, a, a healing for ADHD looked through this window before. And I think it's it's really interesting what you're doing. Thank you. And I will I'll give you credit as well because it wasn't until I saw your videos where I started to really uh, dig into the masculine feminine and thinking, could that be related, right? Because at the beginning, you're like, it's a big, it's a, it's a different topic. It's so big and so much is happening in that space. But as you were talking and I was on a walk listening to you and I was like, wait, this could be related. Why don't I reach out? So I appreciate you uh, uh, accepting the invitation and certainly inspired me again and, and created this, this, this great vision. Okay, well, it's my pleasure, Roman. Thank you. I appreciate that. And perhaps we'll do a follow up sometime. I know you're busy out there in, in, in the UK and, and I wish you all the best. Thank you for, for the work you're doing, because like I said, it's touched me from across the pond and I'm sure many others. And uh, I look forward to continuing the dialogue. So thank you. Yeah, Rafa. I'm open to that. And as it's still locked down here. I have, I have more time than I do when I'm traveling and doing a lot of groups. So um, I would welcome your invitation. Thank you.